Let me say this morning how appreciative I am to be here with you. And as I try to speak to you for just a little while this morning, I hope that you will continue to pray for me in a silent way as my good friend Elder Virgil Herring has prayed publicly. You know, there are a few things that stick with you over the years and all the preaching that I've heard and the failures that I've made. There are many sermons that have stuck with me over the years by men, and I can go back and I can recount those and recall them. I have the propensity to do that the older I get. Uh, one of the great messages that I've heard uh, during my ministry not long ago, I heard Brother Will preach it down at Good Hope Church at the Mid Association. Another one I heard was Brother Virgil Hare preached at Union Church at Woodville, Alabama some years back. And every once in a while that those sermons will come back and swirl in my mind where I can recount them and it's like bread cast upon the water that returns to us after many days. And that's what the word of God does for us. That's the reason we come to the house of God. We're not here trying to populate heaven but we need to be reminded on a constant basis of the Word of God, the principles of the Word of God. Men change, things change, circumstances change, people change. But I'm here to tell you the principles of God's Word do not change. They cannot change. Inspired men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, not moved on but they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And they pinned these things down for God's glory and our edification and the upbuilding of God's cause and kingdom here in the world. And it's been a privilege for me to be here with you during this time since Brother Martin called me back several months ago. I would planned on being here with you through the day and my surgeon wanted me to have my surgery done last two or three weeks ago. And I said, no, I've got two meetings to go to. He said, what difference that make? I said, I know it don't make any difference with you. <laughs> but I said, it makes a difference with me. And uh, so uh, I went to Trail Branch and wanted to come here and then we'll uh, get all this over with. And I thank you for your prayers, your concern. And, and uh, I know that you'll continue to do that. And I look forward to a quick recovery from all of this. This being the last service of this series of meetings, I thought about last night after I came over here, and I want you to know I have a problem sleeping a lot of times, but I slept better last night than I've slept in months, so I thank you for that. I'm not charge you for that this morning, but, but I, I slept better than I've slept in months last night. And uh, I began to think, out of all that's been preached and of all that's been said and the thoughts that have been revived in our hearts and souls and minds, what is the pinnacle of the preaching of the gospel being? And you know, during things that I say and my position and people that I speak to, what I do is to try to summarize some things that I think will be good for the audience that I'm dealing with. I summarize that. And you know, when I began to think about what we had heard, I went to the book of Philippians and I began to summarize what we have heard and what we have felt. Now I want to tell you this. 
I, I, I said this before, we may have said it here. I wouldn't give you a dime for preaching that you can't feel. I didn't get many amens out of that. But I want you to know when I, when I leave here today, that I will have felt something. Amen. That I will have a stirring down in and deep in my soul. I didn't come here for a lecture. There's a difference in teaching and preaching. The Bible tells me in Matthew 12 and 1 that Jesus both talked and preached in the synagogue. Teaching enlightens the mind. We need teaching. I don't discount that at all. But I want you to understand that preaching touches the soul. And when preaching touches the soul, I leave encouraged. I leave even though a sinner I be. Not encouraged in myself, but encouraged in the great, wonderful, sovereign work of God. And Paul began to finalize or summarize his message to the church at Philippi. And in all the books of ecclesiastical history, and especially all the books of the Bible, you'll never find uh, a more faithful or more dedicated people than the church at Philippi. This is the only church that Paul said in Philippians 1 and 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. That's the only church he ever said. And as Paul began to preach, and you remember what the genesis of this church was, it was the offspring of the Philippian jailer and his family in that province called Philippi that Paul uh, baptized in the book of Acts. And Paul, as he winds this down, he summarizes all that he said. He summarizes all the uh, principles that he taught. And he said in Philippians 4 and 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. He summarized it all in that. And then he said, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace shall be with you, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. I want to tell you today that throughout all this book, and I rarely entitle a sermon. I, I don't know why, I never have. But this morning I'm going to entitle this one. And I'm going to call it Things to Rejoice In. Things to Rejoice In. Listen to what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Listen with me in uh, Philippians chapter 1 and beginning with verse 15 when he talks about some that preached. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. And you remember this, there were those in that day that wanted to add afflictions to Paul's bonds. That's what he's saying. Paul was bound to the word of God. 
Paul and the apostles were bound uh, by the authority of heaven to preach and to execute God's word to the churches they came in contact with. But there were those that uh, had an ulterior, ulterior motive. They were those that sought to bring strife and uh, even in envy uh, it was their purpose to add uh, to the afflictions of the apostle Paul and the other uh, apostles. Some preached Christ of contention not sincerely supposing to add to my bonds but the other of love knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Now before I go any further I want you to understand that every man that has ever been called and qualified of God he must be set or determined in the defense of the gospel. Amen. It's not that the gospel needs defending. We don't have to defend the truth. The truth can uh, hold its own with anything. But what I am saying to you is that we are obligated to promote, teach, uh, and to solidify what we understand and know of the New Testament church to be. Amen? Amen. He said, what then? That's the question. Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and rejoice. Listen to what verse 26 says. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs and that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. In chapter 2 and verse 1, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. He says in chapter uh, 2 and beginning with verse 17, Yea, and if I be offered on the sacrifice, the altar of sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. Again, he says here in verse 28, I sent uh, Ephroditus. I send him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again ye may rejoice that I may be less sorrowful and that is less sorrowful when he comes. He said I'm sorry that I can't be there but when Ephroditus comes he said I, I want you to rejoice that I be less sorrowful. Then chapter 3 in verse 1 finally my brethren rejoice in the Lord. To write unto you these same things, he says, he is indeed not grievous, but he says, but for you it is safe. My friend, I want you to understand today that we need to hear these things again and again and again for the simple reason it is not grievous. It is not something that comes to naught, but for you, the church and believing people of God, it is safe. It is good. That's what he says. Now things to rejoice in. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 16 says, Brethren, rejoice evermore. Amen. Rejoice evermore. So I said, well, preacher, you think I'll rejoice when circumstances that I don't like come? You think I'll rejoice uh, when people are sick? You think I'll rejoice? Uh, no, I'll tell you right now, we're not, uh, I'm not telling you to rejoice uh, because bad circumstances come, but I'm telling you, you can rejoice in spite of those bad circumstances. Amen. Why? Because I'll tell you right now, there's a God in heaven. There's a God in heaven that still sits there and rules in his own will, in his own way. 
I'm going to give you five things in the next 30 minutes that I want you to rejoice in today. That I think that Paul identifies with right here. Now I tell you when he says, uh, he says uh, concerning uh, himself and the work of God, he said in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, he says this. Notice the terminology. Uh, he says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Brother, and I tell you right now, when you read that text, you have something to rejoice in. He that began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have that workmanship in us. You know what? You are the ship that the workman worked on. Uh, he, he speaks it like this. He says this. We are his workmanship uh, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Don't get it in your mind that salvation is not a work. It is, but it's God's work in you. You hear that? That's what we're talking about. It's God's work in you. And he that begun that good work will perform it or continue that work until long as you live above sin. You're not living on probation. No, sir. I'll tell you right now, when you understand today that he that began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You talk about a surety and a security, right there it is. Uh, I think I, again, I, I can't remember what I preached anymore where. But you know, I've got a, I've got a chair at home. And uh, I did have, and my, my wife would been after me for years to get rid of that chair. Uh, it's a red chair, and uh, you know, it didn't look very good, honest to God, it didn't. But, uh, you know, it fit me pretty good, Brother Stewart. It sagged where I sagged, if you don't know the truth. <laughs> I mean, it, it, where, where I was out of shape, it was out of shape. So anyway, uh, she was asking me to go buy a new chair. And so, I, you know, I hadn't bought a chair lately, but I tell you, they were expensive. A good chair. I wanted a He-Man chair. I wanted a big one, you know. And so uh, uh, I, 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 I stopped there at the furniture store, and I knew this guy, and I thought he'd give me a pretty good deal. He said, man, I'm giving you a good deal, and it was still expensive. And so anyway, I started home, and there was a fellow there at Rainsville, right at the crossing where I turned to go to my house. He had a truck sitting there, and he had a chair just like that one in the furniture store. And uh, I stopped there, and he said, I said, how much is that? Put it on my truck. How much do I owe you? And he, it was about a third of what that one was. I said, man, I've hit the jackpot. I've hit the jackpot. You know, I said, put it on my truck. I came to the house. I finally got it in the house. Uh, I didn't sit down in it for a while. I, I went in there and, I, and I, I sit down in it. I pulled the lever back and I went back and just kept going back. <laughs> Here I was, bottom up, with my head on the uh, baseboard of the living room floor. Uh, you know, I was bleeding everywhere. And uh, something broke on the inside of it. Well, I finally got it out of the house and back on that Dodge Ram right out there. Got it back down there, that, uh, that fella. And I said, man, I said, this thing broke all to pieces. I said, I, I like to, uh, I like to kill me when I turned over in it. I said, what's the matter? He said, poor workmanship. Yeah. I said, what do you mean? He said, it looks good on the outside, but on the inside, poor workmanship. Well, I want to tell you right now, my friend, uh, when God does a work on you, it's not from the outside in. Bless God, it's from the inside out. Yeah. You see, that's the way God does work. And we can rejoice in that today. Yeah, we can rejoice uh, in that. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I, I remember one time when some folks had tried to bind what they called the a wild gathering with fetters and chains. They'd done all they could do, but it didn't have any effect on them. He dwelt among the tombs. He dwelt among the dead. But you know what? The Bible tells me that Jesus came on the scene. And Brother Harry, I'm going to tell you one thing. When Jesus comes on the scene, it always makes a difference. 
The Bible tells me about a blind man. The Bible says Jesus passed by. Yes. Always makes a difference when Jesus passes by. They bound him with fetters and chains. They couldn't do anything with him. Uh, but Jesus came on the scene. Uh, and even the devils that were on the inside of this man knew who Jesus was. Yes. I want to tell you something, Brother Virgil. You better remember this. Men may not know who Jesus is in reality, but I want to tell you the devil knows who he is. Yes, sir. You know what he said? You know what those that legion spoke at? Said, Jesus, thou son of the most high God. He acknowledged it. Jesus, thou son of the most high God, why hast thou come to torment us before the time? To make a long story short, Jesus cast out all those demons. They went into a herd of swine. They ran uh, headlong down the slope and went into the sea. And I'll tell you right now, those uh, that had tried to tame this man uh, with fetters and chains, tried to bind him uh, in every degree, I want to tell you they came along and they found a man uh, there uh, sitting and clothed in his right mind. Yeah. Yes, sir. Amen. I'll tell you right now, no doubt they wondered about it, but I'll tell you right now, Jesus told him, you know what he said to him? <laughs> Don't go out there and write a testimony and tell him uh, what, 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 all, what all you've done for the Lord. Go home to thy friends yeah. and tell them what God has done for you. Yeah. yeah. You know, it doesn't take me long to tell me what I've done, but I'll tell you, it takes me a lifetime to tell what Christ has done for me. On the, on the inside. You know, I'm getting older on the outside. The outward man perishes day by day. But I want to tell you, under the influence of he who has begun a good work in you, the inward man uh, is renewed on a daily basis. He becomes stronger and stronger. Thank God today it's on the inside. I rejoice in that today, don't you? Amen. I rejoice today, Brother Will, because God chose a people in Christ before the foundation of the world. I rejoice today that he elected them to salvation. Now, you know, election is not a result of the fall. A good friend of mine here a while back telling me, he said, Brother Rick, I believe in election. I said, well, how do you believe it? He said, well, the election's a result of the fall. After men fell, God chose. I'll tell you, you may believe it that way. I don't. We don't preach it that way. No. You know, what this fellow's saying is, you know, men fell and God said, well, I better choose some before I lose them all. <laughs> no, that's not it. No, sir. Before there was ever a sinner to sin, before the dust of the highest hills uh, was ever laid, uh, God had purposed in his own mind, in the covenant bonds and by oath uh, of his own promise, uh, God had uh, uh, determined in his own mind in a covenant of redemption to redeem a people uh, from uh, their sins. Before a man ever graced the earth or they ever sung Jesus' sweet name on the hills of Galilee. Thank God I rejoice in that today, don't you? Yeah. I, I remember in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 4, you know what the Bible said? Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 uh, said, According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, uh, having uh, redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Uh, that's in another book. Uh, but having been made a curse for us, uh, he became uh, what he had not been. And the Bible tells me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30 that, that says, Of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. For as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. I'll tell you right now, I can rejoice in that. Amen. I can rejoice that all of them are going to be saved. I can rejoice in the fact that when Christ Jesus went back to heaven, that you went with him. I can rejoice in the fact uh, today that he's there today as an intercessor. He's a bridge over troubled waters. I don't know what kind of trouble you've got today. Everybody's got some. I hear it all the time. Everybody's got some. We live in a land that's filled with trouble. Just the other day, 
a heathenistic governor of New York signed an abortion bill uh, that uh, would allow an abortion to take place uh, at uh, almost the time of birth and then if it didn't work to complete it after the birth is. Yeah. It's amazing to me how God could even have mercy. Amen. I don't rejoice in that. I don't rejoice in those things. But I want to tell you one thing. I rejoice today that there is a God uh, today that will judge the wicked. There is a God today that will judge men. And there will, is a God today uh, that is able to do above and beyond that which we ask or think. Uh, and I affirm to you today uh, that those men may take the life of that child. Those men may do that. Uh, yes, sir, they very may. But I'll tell you right now, they cannot and uh, will not overrule what God has ordained. Amen. I rejoice in that fact today. Amen. I rejoice in that fact. I rejoice today, Brother Will, that Christ has a church in the earth. I rejoice there's a church in the earth. I rejoice that there's one here. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 13, he came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and his disciples asked the question, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say that they are the lies. Some say uh, John the Baptist. Some say one of the prophets. Some say someone else. But he asked the apostles point blank, Whom do ye say that I, the Son of Man, am? That bold apostle Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, or Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And he says this, And upon this rock I will build my church. Amen. That word's in the singular. You hear me? I will build my church. And the gates of hell may not, no, the gates of hell shall not Amen. prevail or overcome. The gates of hell shall not prevail against that word church means ecclesia or the called out you read about the seven churches of Asia I've had folks tell me uh, they, that's represented the seven dispensations of time and that may be right I, I don't know but I'm going to tell you whatever the case is I believe in the Bible to teach that they were seven individual literal historical churches yeah of baptized believers. Some had drifted away. Jesus had been turned out of his own church in Laodicea. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. You know, the world, you know, used to say, Y'all remember Woolworths, amen. Yeah, you, you, you young folks don't, but some of us older folks remember uh, Woolworth by a 10 cent store. Let me tell you today, let me just put it this way. I'm not preaching to you a dollar general Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm not preaching to you a dollar general Jesus or a Woolworth Jesus. No, sir. But there used to be a, a picture that was famous uh, that Jesus knocking at the door. Y'all remember that? You saw it? Yeah, Jesus knocking at the door. And what they were saying was that Jesus was knocking at the sinner's door, pleading with him to let him in. Yeah. Brother, I'll tell you right now, I rejoice today that the Lord Jesus doesn't have to knock at the door. You know, the Lord Jesus doesn't have to knock at the door. For the simple reason he comes in uh, he finds you. He makes you a willing character uh, in the day of his power. That is what the church preaches. Yeah. We have a church today. Somebody said, well, Brother Ricky, I, I, I'm not worthy to be a member of the church. Well, I know that. Amen. You're not. I'm not either. But I'll tell you one thing. There's a God in heaven through Christ that has made you worthy. Yeah. He's made you worthy. But I'll tell you, when you come to the church, somebody said, I'll do as you, I'll do as I please. You don't do as you please belong to the church of God. No. 
You can't do that. No, sir. You know what Paul said in my text right here? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue uh, and any praise, think on these things. I want to tell you right now, when you join the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, you're going to have to give up some things. Right. Going to have to give them up. Yeah. Yes, sir. You're going to have to give them up. I had a man told me one time, he said, Brother Ricky, said, I'll tell you one thing. He said, I'm not giving up my Masonic Lodge for any man's church. Let me tell you right now, he wasn't worthy to be a member of the church yet. Yeah. You know why? Because I'll tell you one thing. Now, I'm not saying they don't do good things. But I'm going to tell you one thing. The Lord didn't set up the Masonic Lodge. The Lord set up the church. The Lord set up the church. That is the only institution that and the home that God instituted in the earth. And he says this. He says uh, this. He said, my church, my church. You're going to have to give up some things. If you're going to be faithful to Christ. If you're going to be faithful to his cause. Do you remember that the Bible says this? In Ephesians 5 and 25, husbands love your wife as Christ also loved the church Amen. and gave himself for it. Now I'm going to tell you, if you don't love your wife enough to give yourself for it, you got the wrong one. Mm -hmm. All right? Think about that. Husbands love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You know, I've been married here for 46 years. My wife, bless her heart, she's had to raise children by herself and me gone preaching and everywhere else. She's, she's been a faithful companion. And 46 years ago in August, when we got married at Zion Hill Primitive Baptist Church, where I'm still the pastor now, I was a pastor then. She came in that door to a house full of folks on her daddy's arm. And I thought she was the prettiest thing I ever saw. You know that? Yeah. And she was, she's still good looking. Amen. This on, this on, man. This tape's on. Because <laughs> I want to get the tape where she can get the <laughs> She's still good looking. She still rings my bell, you know. She still does, yeah. And you know what? When she walked in the door back there on her daddy's arm, you know, I thought she was the prettiest thing I ever saw. Still is. I'll not belabor that point. But I want to tell you, when I saw the bride of Christ, yes. when I saw the church, Brother Virgil, for what it was, Amen. and for its characteristics, and for its identity and for its doctrine. I'll tell you, I rejoiced. Yeah, yeah. I rejoiced then and I rejoice now. I get out, I, I rejoice uh, when I come out uh, of Macedonia Church. I rejoice uh, when I hear the good preaching we've heard. I rejoice uh, in the fellowship of the gospel. I rejoice uh, when I uh, can uh, feel the stirring of the Holy Spirit down deep in my soul. I rejoice in those things because you know why? Tomorrow for a day while I've got to go back to the the courthouse and I'm not going to rejoice anymore. There's nothing out there for me. I don't have fellowship with uh, many of that. You know I don't even have fellowship with many of my kin folks. I'm sorry to say. You know why? We're on a whole different plane when it comes to religion. Yeah. It's not that they're not good people. It's not that they're not fine people, upstanding people. But I'll tell you they don't rejoice in the same Savior I do. They don't rejoice in the same gospel that I do. They tell me that we preach a narrow gospel. They tell me that we preach a gospel so narrow that it only embraces the elect of God. Uh, only embraces just a handful. I want to tell you it's a handful all right, but it's God's handful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's God's handful. <laughs> That's the handful. You know what the Bible tells me? That he holds the seas in the palm of his hand. Yeah. 
That's what he does. I'll tell you it's God's handful and I'll tell you that hand, that handful uh, the church says uh, is embraced uh, in every nation every kindred and every tongue and every people and I'll tell you I rejoice in that today I rejoice in that today I've got about 10 minutes to tell you about my life <laughs> and I've had a good time preaching this morning I'll tell you that Tell Brother Ronnie that I had a good time with you while he was gone. I'll tell him the same. That's all right. I'll talk. I'm telling him I'm glad he was gone today. No, I love him. He's my cousin, you know. I rejoice today that there is nothing that is too hard for the Lord. <laughs> you remember when... The Lord came to Abraham and to Sarah. And you read it in Genesis 18, 14. That you're going to have a son in your old age. You know what Sarah did? She laughed. She laughed. Not possible. She laughed. You know what the name Isaac means? Laughter. Isaac was named after that experience that his mother had. She denied she laughed after that. <laughs> she said, no, I didn't laugh. Lord knew better. You can deny what you want to deny, brother. The Lord knows it better than you do. Amen? Yeah. Said it's not going to happen. Do you know what the Lord said about himself? Now, Abraham didn't say this about the Lord. Sarah didn't say this about the Lord. But I'll tell you what the Lord said about himself. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Amen. I rejoice in that today. Amen. I rejoice in that. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Job extended that same principle. He said, I've come to realize that nothing is too hard for thee. Right. I'll tell you, it's too hard for me to break a sinner's heart. It's too hard for me uh, to have the power of voice and vocabulary to penetrate the heart of the sinner. But I'll tell you, it's not too hard for the Lord. It's not too hard for the Lord. It's not too hard for the Lord to reach uh, uh, somebody in the heart of darkest Africa that wouldn't know a Bible if they saw it. That's not too hard for the Lord. It's not too hard uh, for the Lord uh, to turn a king's heart, whithersoever he will. That's not too hard for the Lord. It wasn't too hard for the Lord to summarize. Uh, the, 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 the case wasn't too hard for the Lord uh, about a wild Gadarean. Uh, but he cast the devils out of that man. They ran headlong into the sea. It wasn't too hard for the Lord. Somebody tells me one time, well, I'll tell you. After a man gets so old, he's hard to save. I've been told that. He goes so long and his heart is so callous that it's hard for him to get saved. I want to tell you something, brother. Don't low rate my God in that way. No. The Lord is able to take that case hardened sinner. The Lord is able to take that case hardened sinner. Penetrate his heart. Take out that heart and stony heart. And give him a heart of flesh and the heart of a child. I saw men who had lived lives that weren't honoring to God, weren't honoring to anybody. I saw men join the church and give up all they had to buy the treasure they'd find. I saw them do that. Yes, sir. I can tell you uh, about a minister. And uh, when you began to realize this, Elder J.E. Holder, a senator from this great state of Mississippi, great debater among our people. Brother Holder said, I'd always heard, he said that unless I was baptized in water, that I had no hope of heaven after a while. 
But he said, when I was a child, he said, a man joined the church. We were having lunch there at the church and we were going to baptize him in that afternoon and walking toward uh, the pit that they had dug in the back of the, uh, the property of the church. He said he was stricken with a heart attack so severe that the buttons popped off of his shirt uh, walking toward uh, the baptistry. And he said, I saw everything uh, that I had been taught and believed fall before me in one man he said that was too hard for men to convince me but he said the Lord convinced me uh, that that was a saved man and the Lord convinced me that the work that he had been uh, begun in his heart was just as sure as it ever was and though he wasn't baptized it did not negate nor neglect the grace of God Amen. I'll tell you today we ought to be baptized that's not, that's not an option, that's a commandment. Amen. It's not an option, it's a commandment. But I want to tell you one thing, my friend. That baptism in water is a figure. Right. It's a figure of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Amen. And when that figure is obeyed, uh, you go down in a watery grave and a wide rise to walk in the newness of life. I'll tell you right now, when that truth is revealed, that's too hard for me. But I'll tell you, when God reveals the truth to you and raises the curtain up and you're able to see Christ for what he is, not a dollar general Jesus, uh, but the King of kings and Lord of lords, I'll tell you, you'll find out then nothing is too hard for the Lord. Amen. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Creation wasn't too hard for the Lord. Workmanship wasn't too hard for the Lord. Not too hard for the Lord. I'll tell you something else. When I st stood at the cemetery on Friday afternoon and we put that body of that man that I knew in the grave, I'll tell you something else too hard for me. I can't get him out. <laughs> too hard for me. Too hard for me. I can't, I can't speak the words and get him out. My words have no power. But I'll tell you right now, it's not too hard for the Lord. <laughs> One of these days after a while, thank God, when the Lord shall return the second time without sin unto salvation, that that's too hard for us is going to be made manifest uh, when the voice of the Lord speaks and all the family of God and all men are raised up uh, before a uh, righteous judge uh, and God would be perfectly just and right uh, in condemning you and banishing you from uh, the, his presence forever and ever. And I'll tell you right now, because he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ, he will judge you righteous on the blessed work of the Son of God. Amen. You'll be judged not because of what you are, but because of who he is. You'll be judged, my friend, uh, because of the imputed righteousness of the Son of God. You'll be judged uh, on that work that was uh, too hard for me and you. But me and you could have went to the cross, but my work and your work would have never availed. Oh, it would have meant nothing. Uh, God would not uh, have accepted our sacrifice. But thank God today. Thank God. Rejoice today. I can rejoice in the fact uh, that it wasn't too hard for the Lord to go to the cross. It wasn't too hard for the Lord to heal the blind man. It wasn't too hard for the Lord to raise Lazarus. And bless God in the last day it will not be too hard for him to raise his people from the dead. Amen. Not be too hard. It's not a difficult job for him. I tell you, I don't know when I've enjoyed trying to preach anymore. You know, hey man, I, you know, it just, you know, this is not anything new to you. Thank God I didn't come over here to bring anything new. You know what? I came over here to stir you up. <laughs> I want to stir you up. You know, that's what, when I get stirred up, I want everybody else to get stirred up. Yeah, you know, when I, when I get happy, I want everybody else to get happy. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, there's a lady uh, one time uh, at, at a church and I was preaching at it. She shouted. And, uh, you know, we used to hear a good bit more of that than we do now. But she shouted and, and somebody said, now just calm down, sister. She said, you didn't stop me and you can't stop me. <laughs> well, I'll tell you right now, brother, uh, that under the rejoicing influence of the Son of God, I'll tell you right now, uh, uh, you didn't start it and bless God, uh, you can't stop it. I can rejoice under the influence of the blessed Savior. I can rejoice under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you, I don't have power to raise the dead. There's some things that's too hard for me. 
But I'm telling you about a God today, and finally, my brethren, this is it. Finally, you see? Finally, rejoice evermore. Why? Because nothing is too hard for the Lord. And I rejoice in those things today. I rejoice in the redemption of his people. I rejoice in my church, in your church. I rejoice in the finished work of Jesus Christ. I rejoice uh, today that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. And I rejoice that there's nothing too hard for the Lord. Things to rejoice in. There's a lot more of them. You can go through it and just keep going on. Uh, that, that's a week's preaching. Uh, if you're able to bear it. But I'm going to tell you right now. I'll rejoice in this last thing. Finally brethren. Finally brethren rejoice. And again I say rejoice. Thank you and may God bless you. Thank you for letting me come to Macedonia again. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your prayers. And thank you uh, for uh, good men like this. That you're faithful to. And these men uh, who raise up the standard of God Almighty uh, that nothing is too hard for him. I'll tell you I'm glad to be an old line primitive Baptist. I'm glad today my friend uh, that I today can stand and declare unto you the unsearchable riches of Christ and that that grace that God has given us in a wonderful and mighty way still uh, today exercises us toward a greater service to God. Amen and amen. And if you're here today and you love these things I'll tell you let me encourage you. Whatsoever things are good. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are a good report, uh, think on these things and God will bless you. Why? Because nothing is too hard for the Lord. Thank you, my God bless you. I'm not done, but I'm going to quit. <laughs>